to our international standing. I call David Clendon. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, it's never a happy sight to see this parliament passing bad law, and that is what we are seeing tonight with the passing of this legislation. We are embedding as a permanent provision in our legislation something which was a mechanism that was marginal at best as a stopgap short-term measure, which is all it was ever intended to be. It intended to respond to the particular moment in time, a, um, an unfortunate series of incidents at Mount Eden and the ongoing public concerns about that. It was intended to be legislation with a sunset clause. It should have been allowed to simply fade away while we did something much more sensible and much more long term. So this legislation and its various iterations, I think this is the, the third cycle of legislation that's gone through, an extension, a continuation bill, and now this, uh, this legislation to make it permanent. It's chewed up an inordinate amount of parliamentary time and resource. And in the meantime, we are told the, the Minister of Justice and her officials are too busy to even consider or contemplate a very good proposition that came from Judge Boucher some seven or eight months ago, proposing that we create an offence of family violence. That would have been a means by which we might actually have addressed the, um, the issue of protecting victims, of reducing the number of victims. That would have been a useful and appropriate means of the resources and time of this House and the people in it. Unfortunately, instead, we're spending time perpetuating bad law, such as this prisoners and victims legislation. So is the government, does the government continue to be genuinely concerned about a public backlash if uh, inmates were seen to, reap, seen to reap some financial benefit, some restitution for having their rights denied them or being suffered abuse while in the custody of the state. If there is a problem, if the government is genuinely concerned about that, the solution actually is self-evident. And the solution is to create a safe, humane, decent environment in our prisons to ensure that inmates do not suffer abuse or denial of rights. And the problem simply goes away. There would not be an issue if we could be, if we create uh, an environment in the prisons where prisoners' rights are secured, where they are safe environments for both inmates and indeed staff who work in them on our behalf. The events at Spring Hill last weekend and indeed the series of events over um, recent months that are becoming more frequent and more serious demonstrate we do not have that safe environment in our prisons. And that is an unfortunate... Um, uh, it, it's, it demonstrates that we have a great deal of work to do, um, genuine work, dealing with finding real solutions to real problems rather than fiddling about the margins with this piece of legislation which actually has not even worked. What we have done here effectively is to create a lose-lose situation. This legislation being embedded in, in legislation takes away the rights of prisoners to fair restitution if their rights are abused or compromised. It diminishes our right to claim we are a country that respects human rights, basic decency, and as the previous speaker pointed out, it does contravene international law. And what do we get in exchange for this? A piece of legislation that over eight years has delivered virtually nothing to victims. A figure of something like 40, 45 thousand dollars has actually been returned to victims under the provisions of this legislation. Less than six thousand dollars a year. Basically pennies, rats and mice, peanuts. We would have been better to not devote any time to it, close the house early one night, save a lot of money and give that to victims. Equally nonsensical suggestion is the one that we continue to embed this piece of legislation that is a lose-lose piece of legislation. It has not worked for eight years. Why will it work for another eight years or eight years beyond that? It simply makes no sense. Sir, it's been claimed that the Greens' opposition to this bill reflects some sort of lack of concern for the well-being of victims. Indeed, at an earlier reading, one of the uh, government spokespeople saw fit to suggest that I had made a speech on this bill without once mentioning the word victim. In fact, I suggest a course in active listening to that member, because I continually referred to victims. And 
um, in my 10-minute speech. That particular member managed about 90 seconds of commentary on this very important piece of legislation. We do have significant concerns for the well-being and rights of victims and would seek to put in place a comprehensive review. When the Greens supported this bill in 2005, somewhat reluctantly, but we did support it, on the understanding that there would be a comprehensive review of the rights of victims, ideally a cross-party approach, as Mr Little has indicated. And I was somewhat surprised to hear the Chair of the um, Justice and Electoral Committee, a competent and typically quite amiable Chair, talking about this Government's um, comprehensive reform of the justice sector. I think they're being remarkably modest. If they're undertaking a comprehensive reform of the justice sector, why aren't they telling anybody about it? So there is no evidence of any such comprehensive reform. We're seeing short-term, reactive, stop-gap measures. Nothing Sorry to interrupt, the Honourable Member. The time has come for me to leave the chair for the dinner break. This debate is interrupted. I shall resume the chair at 7.30. <laughs>